and welcome back to Agritecture's Travel Free Digital Conference Series. My name is Eric Roth. Thank you so much for, for watching today. I'm here with Nick Nikolaev, uh, who is the co-founder and CEO of Rooted Leaf. Nick, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. So Nick is going to go through uh, a short presentation he has about his company, and uh, we look forward to seeing it. So take it away whenever you're ready, Nick. Perfect. Okay, so this is our company, Rooted Leaf Agritech. The presentation today, um, we'll just kind of go through the introduction. We'll start off talking a little bit about who we are as a company, what our focus is, then we'll get into the sort of the meat of the sandwich. Um, it's going to be about carbon as an invisible deficiency. And then we'll kind of tie back in some of the macronutrients, you know, NPK, calcium, magnesium. Um, and we're going to do it from the perspective of carbon metabolism. You know, why do plants use nitrogen specifically? to capture more carbon and how do they do that and why is carbon so important? Um, and then we'll kind of wrap up. There's going to be a brief conclusion where we'll just uh, kind of go over some of the uh, major points again. And then there's going to be a little contact information and an email address that uh, your viewers can contact us at. Okay. So about Rooted Leaf, um, we are a manufacturer of specialty fertilizers. We're based in Arlington, Washington. Um, right now we're specifically focused on the commercial cannabis, and hemp industries. Um, so we supply a lot of the recreational producers here in Washington state under the 502 program. Um, we've got customers in Oregon and certainly across the United States that we're working with, um, both indoor and outdoor. So uh, our focus is on uh, from scratch chemical engineering. We make everything in-house from scratch. Um, this involves a lot of organic synthesis reactions, a lot of chemistry. Um, we're not really using anybody else's inputs. Um, and like I said, in-house manufacturing, you know, everything, we, we do take it seriously. Everything that we make is sort of designed specifically to um, have a particular function or a particular purpose. So we're really looking at the kind of the nitty gritty details as to how exactly that happens. Um, and taking it back to the very beginning of chemical reactions um, lets us control and have some flexibility in the system as we build it out. Uh, we do take a carbon centric approach. Um, we are obsessed with carbon. It's basically the bread and butter of our business. And it also differentiates us from other fertilizer manufacturing companies. So let's just get right into it. Carbon, the invisible deficiency. Um, we were going to call this presentation carbon, the forgotten element in agriculture, but I feel like that would be a little misleading, particularly because a lot of our commercial cannabis producers um, here in Washington, at least they'll, supplement or inject carbon dioxide into sealed grow rooms. And obviously for anyone who's done that before, um, they know that it actually does make a big impact on the overall yield and quality. So it's not something that people necessarily have forgotten about, but maybe it's something that they just need to frame it in a different perspective to better understand how carbon can be an invisible deficiency. Your plants may look very, very healthy, but is there something that's being left on the table? Um, the answer to that question is, Probably yes. So let's go through it. Let's get started. Um, and I guess just as kind of a broad overview, you know, why is carbon important? Um, it makes up everything that you can see, touch, feel, and taste in a plant. You know, the zest of a lemon peel, the starch in a potato, um, the color or the hue of a purple carrot, um, anything and everything that a plant can make revolves around carbon. So when we're talking about things like improving the yield and quality of Food crops, for example, that typically comes down to how much of a carbon load is placed on the plants. And it, for us in particular, our customers, you know, because they're growing recreational cannabis, they're really looking at things like THC, CBD, cannabinoids, and other terpenes. Well, it turns out that um, THC and CBD are about 80% carbon by weight. And some of the uh, terpenes that cannabis produces, like myrcene and limonene, um, they can be closer to 90% carbon by weight. So it's overwhelming. Uh, majority of those molecules are carbon. So if you need to increase your yields or increase your quality and potency, really what you're looking at doing is increasing the carbon load that's placed on the plants. Um, and just as kind of a quick overview, we'll have pictures like this scattered throughout the slide, but you know, really the whole point here is to understand how carbon works um, within plant tissue um, and, and kind of fits into a larger system of what plants are trying to do. Um, and the, the gist or the general idea is that anything and everything that plants can do with nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium or even calcium and magnesium that's all going to revolve around capturing more carbon and we'll get into that briefly but here's a quick little picture for your viewers to see how water can get 
uptaking through the roots and the xylem tissue. So you have water and dissolved minerals that works its way up to the leaf tissue where they become constituents of, let's say, proteins like chlorophyll, which are responsible for photosynthesis. And that sucks more carbon out of the air and allows the plants to have building blocks to make more tissue, to uptake more water. And it's basically a cycle that feeds itself. So I guess one of the questions we're asked quite often is what happens when you increase the carbon load on the plants? Um, you, you find a, a number of beneficial effects such as more efficient photosynthesis. You know, the plants can convert a little bit more effectively. They can condense more carbon out of the air with higher CO2 levels. Um, the water uptake goes up quite a bit as the plants have access to more uh, minerals, more nutrients, more building blocks to make more tissues. Um, this in turn leads to faster growth, bigger yields, and more carbon-rich compounds. And it doesn't matter if you're growing carrots and strawberries and tomatoes, or if you're a commercial cannabis producer and you're just looking at things like THC and terpenes. Um, by increasing the carbon load on your plants, you can effectively get more of basically anything that you want your plants to produce. So you'll see here plants do cycle through nutrients and one of the things that they can cycle through is carbon. Um, any kind of carbon that's captured up here in the leaves during the day can work its way down to the roots. And sometimes those roots at nighttime will actually secrete organic acids and some of the metabolites that were produced as a result of photosynthesis. And typically that's to feed beneficial microbes um, and to allow certain types of mineral nutrients to be resolubilized in the organic acid formats that plants can uptake them. So it's kind of like a push-pull cycle. You know, they suck carbon out of the air, they move it down to the roots, um, and then from there they'll kind of uh, recycle it in the plant. So um, you'll find that there's an improved or increased quality of all of the crops. Um, increased therapeutic compounds for crops such as ashwagandha, lavender, sage, ginseng, um, food crops, same thing. You know, we're finding new increased nutritional content with apples, potatoes, spinach, coconut, hemp seeds, cherries are a great example. Um, it's been shown that, uh, you know, with apples and cherries in particular, um, calcium is one that's really important to get into them in the later stages of fruiting, but um, carbon actually drives exactly how those minerals are utilized. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that uh, works best with the increased carbon load or one of the, the best benefits is that the plants actually have an increased uh, disease resistance and pest pressure resistance. So a lot of times the secondary metabolites are used as compounds to help deter against pests and predators and things like that. And if the plants have access to more carbon, they can inherently make more of the defensive compounds that they kind of rely on. So when we're talking about high intensity grow environments like a sealed room, for example, um, if a bug works its way into a sealed room, it could be the equivalent of heaven, right? It's a never ending all you can eat buffet. So the plants have to somehow deal with that kind of stress. And by increasing the carbon load, the plants automatically have a greater capacity to deal with all the disease and pest pressures that they might um, face. So ultimately this leads us to the question of, is carbon a macronutrient? And the answer definitely is yes, absolutely. I think it's not treated as a macronutrient, but certainly when you look at uh, the percent by composition, plants are predominantly carbon. It's just what they are, so. Here's a nice little cross section of the roots and on the right hand side, you can kind of see roots that have been, you know, there's a lot going on here. There's some beneficial microbes. There's some of these little adventitious roots growing. There's beneficial fungus, so on and so forth. And, and this type of beneficial soil chemistry only really happens when we're talking about increasing the carbon load in the soil. Now, typically this is done with organic matter. A lot of growers will uh, supplement humic acid or some kind of organic soil amendment to kind of get the carbon load in there help balance things out, you know, condition the chemical and physical properties of the soil, things like that. And then on the left side, you can see um, not as much activity going on. You know, the roots don't have as much surface area. There's fewer microbe species overall. Um, and if a pathogen or some kind of disease pressure gets into the soil, it's a lot more difficult for the plants to resist that. So if you have root rot or pythium or something like that, um, it can be easier for, you know, the, the, uh, the predators and the pathogens to basically take hold of the plant and do some damage. So having extra carbon can help um, create some kind of added immune system for the plants. So where does this carbon come from? What are some of the sources? Um, well, there's only two real sources if you think about it. It either comes from the air in the form of CO2 or it comes from your fertilizers. Um, and typically with salt-based fertilizer, 
like a traditional 50 pound bag of calcium nitrate, there's not going to be any carbon in there. Um, so salt-based fertilizer doesn't really have much carbon. When we're talking about dry organic fertilizer, like a blood meal or a bone meal or something to that effect, most of the carbon is going to be insoluble. Um, when we're talking about liquid organic, like a liquefied kelp extract, for example, oftentimes the carbon will be uh, micronized or it'll be in a suspension, meaning that it's still technically insoluble, but the surface area is so small and the particle is so fine that it can kind of be suspended in water. So a lot of people think that suspensions are soluble. This isn't necessarily true. What you're looking for if you want to supplement an additional carbon load on your plants is finding forms of carbon that are soluble carbon, meaning they're 100% bioavailable for the plants. The plants don't have to do anything to break it down. They can passively uptake it and passively absorb it. Um, and this typically is in the form of low molecular weight compounds, things like organic acids um, and other such metabolites that would be naturally produced by plants. And there's a big difference in terms of the overall availability. So um, part of what we wanted to do was talk a little bit about how soluble uh, forms of carbon, carbon are different than the dry organic or the liquid organic, but we chose to instead focus a little bit more on how the other macronutrients kind of tie into carbon metabolism. So with that being said, we'll kind of um, shift gears a little bit and focus on that. So um, because carbon is really, it can really only be absorbed through the leaves and the roots, um, we got to look at the various forms of that carbon. You know, is it in the form of CO2 across the leaf surface? Did a grower apply a foliar spray that had organic acids? Same thing with the roots. Are we talking about sugars, amino acids? Are there oligosaccharides, um, phenolic compounds, things like that? So the, the form of the carbon is actually very important. Um, a lot of times the plants will produce metabolites as uh, signaling molecules, like terpenes are a great example. Some terpenes can serve as signaling molecules. So the idea here is that not all forms of carbon are the same. Some have effects on signaling you know, between various cells. Some have uh, different effects, like amino acids can be constituents of proteins, such as chlorophyll, for example. So we really want to look at the specific form of carbon that we're giving the plants in order to understand what kind of effect we're going to have. So with that being said, let's kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about how the macronutrients and calcium and magnesium fit into carbon metabolism. And we're going to take a carbon centric approach, meaning that when we talk about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, um, we're going to be looking at how these elements uh, affect carbon metabolism in a plant. And I think there's a couple of really good examples for each element that will help paint the picture of why carbon is so important to plants and why it's really it really should be considered its own kind of macronutrient. Um, and it always comes back to carbon, everything that we talk about and everything that plants can do, it always comes back to carbon. So when we look at nitrogen, for example, one of the things that we're primarily focused on is the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And the reason that's so important is because nitrogen in order to really be useful for a plant has to be bound to carbon. Um, you know, it starts off as nitrogen um, gas in the air and then through a series of microbial, uh, uh, chemical reactions, that nitrogen in gaseous form is going to be converted to ammoniacal nitrogen, and then the amine group, the head group, will become a constituent of amino acids, and then amino acids subsequently become proteins and so on and so forth. But the real key here is that the plants have to combine nitrogen with carbon in order to make them useful. It's effectively essentially what amino acids are. And if you look at the actual structures that plants create using carbon and nitrogen, you know, you're, you're going to find a predominant amount of carbon that you, or I'm sorry, a, a large amount of the nitrogen that you put on your plants actually becomes chlorophyll, which powers carbon fixation through photosynthesis, or it becomes rubisco. And now rubisco is the enzyme that actually scrubs carbon out of the air. So um, it's kind of, it's interesting how plants will take a majority of the nitrogen that you supply them and create proteins whose sole function it is to capture more carbon out of the air. So more carbon equals more nitrogen and more nitrogen equals more carbon potential for the plants. It always comes back to that cycle. You know, how does the plant get more carbon? Um, and between chlorophyll and rubisco, you know, some plants will produce about 50% of their overall leaf protein in the form of this one enzyme right here, rubisco. So it's pretty profound to say that, you know, up to 50% of the total protein content in the leaf can be a single enzyme which just captures more carbon. That's it, that's all it does. So um, 
if you look at how nitrogen is metabolized in the plant, you'll basically find something like this, right? This is kind of a simple illustration here, but it just, it shows that amino acids get linked into peptides and those peptides are then linked into proteins. And then proteins are the things that do work in the plant, like chlorophyll, for example, or like a rubisco as an enzyme, for example. So um, we'll move on to phosphorus now. Phosphorus, the way I like to think about phosphorus is it's kind of like the, the other half of photosynthesis, right? The plants start off with CO2 in the air and then they condense that CO2, but what happens after that? You know, where does it go? What does it become? Does it become a sugar? Does it become some kind of organic acid? Um, phosphorus is the thing that's going to control how that carbon is actually metabolized. So there are pools of carbon that are formed as a result of the interaction that phosphorus has in the plants. We're looking at things like sugar phosphates, carboxylic acids, um, even the structure of the DNA of the plant. Um, some of those sugars are phosphorus containing. And then there's also particular types of chemical reactions. These are called phosphorylation reactions. And phosphorylation reactions are required for plants to make cannabinoids and terpenes. Um, they're very energy intensive pathways, just because if you really think about it, like THC has, if I recall correctly, 21 atoms of carbon in its structure. And the question is always, well, how do plants go from CO2 in the air, which is a single unit of carbon, to a molecule of THC, which has 21 units of carbon, right? There's a lot of steps involved in that process of just linking things together, joining them head to tail, and then getting something that ultimately has 21 units of carbon in that chain. So that pathway primarily is known as phosphorylation, where phosphorus is required to drive some of these uh, reactions that will link carbon and uh, species of carbon together. For terpenes and cannabinoids, it's isoprene, so it's a five carbon building block that is joined together from head to tail fashion. So it does require a lot of energy and that energy is supplied by the form of phosphorus. Um, and because phosphorus tends to be a, an energizer, so to speak, it's like the battery for the plant, it kind of moves stuff around. Um, one of the things that it does is also shuttles other nutrients. It allows plants to uptake more nutrients because more of that carbon can be assimilated into um, transport enzymes and things like that. Um, a lot of compounds are actively transported by plants. Calcium is a great example of an element that in the cytoplasm, uh, it may not be very mobile because its diffusion is not passive, but rather active, meaning that the plants have to create some proteins or enzymes that will move the calcium around. And that requires energy, that requires carbon, both of which can come from phosphorus. Uh, and then this little graphic right here just kind of shows, shows us the relationship between you know, the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis where the light comes in and you've got water coming in, oxygen going out. Um, in this process right here, there's basically an electrochemical gradient that's generated that allows plants to create ATP. And the P in there obviously is for the phosphorus. This phosphorus goes into the Calvin cycle and you'll notice that CO2 actually enters into the Calvin cycle and it leaves basically as a sugar. Um, and this is a very rough approximation of how the cycle actually happens. But the important part is that there's a, there's a coupling or there's a link between some of the light dependent reactions in the Calvin cycle with CO2 and phosphorus. Basically, it's how does carbon actually get moved around by the plant and then what does it become? Does it become a, a new piece of root tissue? Does it become a new piece of leaf tissue? Is it part of the stalk? Is it a trichome? Is it a, a cannabinoid? Something like that. So all that stuff can be controlled downstream by phosphorus, basically. Moving on to potassium, um, I think potassium is best known for its role in enzyme activation. And um, potassium is fascinating because it controls more enzymes than any other element. And when we're talking about carbon metabolism, pot uh, potassium is really the element that drives more carbon metabolism than any other element. Um, you know, when plants have to do something with that carbon, it's potassium that basically acts as a switch. It turns proteins on and it turns them off and it controls the downstream effect of where that carbon goes. It's also known as the great balancer. Um, it really does balance out the cells in the plant. Um, you know, earlier when we were talking about nitrogen, we talked about that carbon to nitrogen ratio and that's so critical for plants. I mean, they really do balance their growth based on how much carbon and nitrogen are available to them. Um, because the, the, the issue that can arise is sometimes if you have too much nitrogen, and not enough carbon, the plants don't have a sink for all that nitrogen, and that's where you start to experience some toxicity effects. Um, you may get accumulation effects or some adverse impacts between nitrate forms of nitrogen with 
other types of uh, nutrients that are in the soil, but having ample levels of potassium allows the plants to control that carbon to nitrogen ratio, basically. Um, osmolites are things that uh, will sort of control the levels of salt inside of plants, because as plants metabolize, let's say you're feeding them very heavy amounts of fertilizer, you know, they're dealing with a, a high salt load or a high fertilizer load. Um, and so the idea there is to try to balance out how much water versus salt is present on the inside of the cells at any given time. So that fits into the osmoregulators, um, which basically control transpiration. You know, there's these little pores uh, on the underside of leaf surfaces called stomata that basically they open and they close to allow CO2 to come in and oxygen and water to go out via transpiration. And the better control you have over that process, the more likely the plant is to, to, to find a sort of a, a balance point. You know, it's not going to be desiccated because it transpired all of its water to fix very little carbon. Um, and these are some of the pathways that kind of fit into how um, cacti and succulents metabolize. They're obviously significantly different than cannabis plants, but it just goes to show that plants across the world have developed strategies to allow the exchange of gases to occur without necessarily desiccating themselves, right? In a dry desert environment, there's not a whole lot of benefit or purpose associated with losing all of the water only to gain a little bit of carbon. So having the ability to regulate and balance that I think is very important. And it certainly comes back to potassium. And then all functions of primary and secondary metabolism. Uh, you know, we just talked about water uptake and gas exchange. Um, the secondary metabolism piece is actually very important because if the plants, let's say the plant is being attacked by some kind of fungal pathogen or some kind of disease pressure, um, really the, the plant's only defense system is to produce some kind of compound. Um, plants don't have feet. They can't just get up and move. They can't go to a different patch of soil. That's a little bit more ideal. They kind of have to deal with the environment that they're stuck in. So that being said, their first uh, reaction is always going to be to try to produce some kind of compound that alleviates the stress, whether it's biotic or abiotic stress. And potassium is going to be the switch, basically, that activates that. And then going back to the stomata and the guard cells that we were talking about, you can kind of see this overview here. Um, inside of these vacuoles here, there is water and potassium. And if the water and potassium are inside of the vacuoles, the guard cells will actually stay in a state of being swollen and open. And in this little hole right here is where the gas is going to get exchanged, right? CO2 can solubilize and then oxygen and water can uh, leave the, the, the leaves basically, right? Transpiration can occur. Um, and then at nighttime when the plants go to sleep, the lights turn off, these stomata will actually close. And the closing happens specifically as a function of potassium. The vacuoles will um, decrease in size and all of the uh, water and potassium will leave the vacuoles. And they'll kind of come out into these other cells that are in the epidermis and in the other layers of the plants. So as the potassium leaves, the stomata will close because they shrink and that physically contracts and close, closes things down for the day. So these signals are very important because if the plants had their stomata open while the lights were off, they would basically, it would throw their metabolism way off um, and it would not be very good for actual growth. So um, calcium, primarily calcium is known uh, for its ability to reinforce the cell walls. It binds to sugar acids, and it allows the plant to basically separate what the cell is from what the cell is not. And having a thicker cell wall is really important because it allows the plant to deal with some of the high intensity environments that we find in commercial cannabis production facilities. I mean, some of our customers have thousand watt double ended lights that are sitting less than two feet away from the surface of the plants or the tops of the plants. And that's really, really intense lighting. We're talking 1250 plus PPFD. Um, in most cases, that kind of light intensity would be enough to uh, wreak havoc on the cell wall just because it's such a intensive amount of radiation and energy that unless the plants have really thick cell walls and structures and they know what to do with it, um, that energy can actually be counterproductive. So there is such a thing as too much light. And certainly for all of us that have grown before, we know what it's like to fry your plants under too much light. So having ample supplies of calcium uh, present in the cell walls will, will, will allow the plants to metabolize even high levels of carbon, uh, such as in rooms where CO2 is being introduced or injected without necessarily burning to a crisp. Um, one of the other major considerations of calcium is that it controls information flow. Um, the signals 
that calcium distributes in plants flows in waves. And these waves are much like what neurons are in the human brain. I mean, if, if plants had a nervous system or a neural network, it would definitely be calcium as the, the uh, actor or the firing uh, signaling compound that transmits all of the information from cell to cell. Um, and along the way, so, you know, as these calcium uh, waves move through plants, their patterns and their uh, frequencies um, encode certain types of information. And these types of information have been shown to regulate biotic and abiotic stress tolerance. So we're, we're looking at things like disease and environmental pressures. Um, and one of the best examples was when a Japanese researcher had genetically modified a plant to produce a pigment. And this pigment lit up in the presence of calcium. So what they found was that when you cut a plant, like we have in this first slide here, the most immediate thing that happens, and it occurred within a minute here in this example, is that calcium waves flowed from cell to cell in each plant, and it spread information about what was happening. Here, because this is a mechanical stress, the plant basically thought it was being attacked. Let's say it was by a caterpillar or some kind of an insect that eats the leaves. Um, and you'll, you'll see all of these little, the, 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 um, you know, this glowing right here is basically calcium moving its way across the plant. And within two or three minutes, the whole plant will basically look like this where it's fixed in this state. You know, the calcium has spread from cell to cell, spreading particular types of messages. And these messages, they activate defensive pathways in plants. Um, for any grower that has taken a cutting off their plant and put it into a reservoir to clone it, there's a there's a difference in the leaves if you cut the leaves the ends of the leaves off they become very rigid and they don't become droopy but if you leave the leaves whole they actually do become droopy and they become very soft to the touch but by cutting them you're effectively promoting this uh this calcium message being sent across the plant so there's that rigidity that's built in because the, the whole plant is flooded with calcium and again that calcium serves a couple of purposes one is as a signaling molecule as we see here and then the second is as a constituent of the cell wall to actually help reinforce it against some kind of disease pressures or biotic stress, abiotic stress. So this right here is pretty profound. I think that for the longest time, most people were under the impression that calcium is not mobile in plants. Um, there's a grain of truth in that, but generally speaking, it's not 100% true. Not only is calcium mobile, but the mobility of calcium is absolutely required for plant life to occur. If if calcium was immobile, then, you know, plants wouldn't be able to send these types of signals and messages, and there would be really no basis for a plant-wide response. Um, so what it comes down to is, again, if calcium, if plants have brains and nervous systems, then calcium is definitely like a neuron that fires information. All right, going on to magnesium. Magnesium has a disproportionately large impact on the capture and the storage and the transportation and the release of all types of energy in plants. So it's a small element, but has a very, very big impact. Um, a couple of slides earlier, we kind of went through CO2 fixation with the Rubisco enzyme, and we went through photosynthesis in, in chlorophyll. Um, turns out that magnesium is actually the, at the very center of both Rubisco and chlorophyll. So if you looked at a, a you know, a, a, um, a unit of chlorophyll under a microscope, you'd see at the very center of it is a magnesium ion. It's actually the magnesium that captures the energy from the sun. And it's actually the magnesium that drives or pounds the carbon inside of plant tissue with this Rubisco enzyme right here. Because um, again, it starts off as CO2 in the air, and then you can basically think of magnesium like an actual hammer and CO2 as a nail, right? That hammer pounds CO2 inside of plant tissue and that carbon becomes fixed or trapped inside of some organic acid or sugar phosphate. Uh, and again, going back to ATP with phosphorus, as part of the Krebs cycle, magnesium is actually the thing that transports ATP around. So when most people talk about ATP, what they're actually referencing is magnesium ATP. You know, if magnesium wasn't there to carry it around, there'd be no such benefit or no such thing as ATP. Um, so. You know, again, it's a small element, it's considered a micronutrient, but it has a disproportionate, very, very large impact on the overall carbon metabolism of a plant and how exactly that happens. And then here's a little slide cross section of the leaf. If you zoom into a leaf, you see these cells right here. And zooming far enough into the cells, you see these uh, stacks of thylakoids. They're like these little coins, basically. And inside of them, there's these uh, little granite that contain um, 
chlorophyll. And you can't quite see it here, but there's a structure of chlorophyll that's drawn out with magnesium being at the center. So again, when light kind of shines on a plant and hits that leaf surface, it's really magnesium, the thing that captures the energy from the sun, and then it passes that energy downstream to a number of different uh, photosystems and protein complexes that will ultimately create an electrochemical gradient that then powers the Calvin cycle or the Krebs cycle, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's very important when we're talking about high intensity environments and getting more carbon into the plants. Oftentimes, the, the minimum recommended magnesium levels are not enough when we're looking at things like, you know, putting the, the amount of CO2 in a room three or four times the normal atmospheric concentration. Um, plants need more magnesium if, if they are to drive more carbon inside of leaf tissue. So that's kind of the, the overall gist um, that all plant nutrition does revolve around carbon. Um, and then in 100% of the cases, adding the extra carbon load is well worth it. You know, it doesn't matter if you're growing blueberries and strawberries or if you're growing hemp and cannabis, you're gonna get better pigmentation, better color, better uh, pharmacological and therapeutic compounds with higher density and all that stuff by increasing the carbon load. Um, and above all, I think carbon deficiencies are invisible. You know, if you look at a plant and think it's healthy, um, it could very well be healthy, but the question is always, are you leaving something on the table? You know, if you were to double the carbon load on the plant, what would it look like? Because um, the leaves could be very dark green, very healthy, but if they're not fixing as much carbon as they have the potential to, then you're really missing out in the way of overall terpene and cannabinoid concentrations or overall sugar content, bricks content, if you're a grape farmer, for example. Uh, and then not all forms of carbon are the same. You know, you, you want the soluble and the bioavailable forms. Um, if you're in a hydroponic, like if you're a microgreen grower, for example, and if you're in a recirculating system, it doesn't make sense to add cow manure into your reservoir because it's going to create a lot of problems. Yeah, it, it does have a high carbon content, but it's not the right type of carbon. You know, a, a hydroponic grower would be better suited with low molecular weight organic acids or very simple and basic sugars. Um, things like that, maybe some phenolic compounds to help signal to the plant what to do with all that extra nutrient load and all that stuff. But soluble and bioavailable is the most desirable, which is exactly what our product line is, is built around the concept of soluble and bioavailable carbon signaling molecules, things like that. So um, if you guys would like to learn more, please feel free to email me directly, nick at rootedleaf.com, N-I-K at R-O-O-T-E-D-L-E-A-F.com and take a look at our website www.rootedleaf.com and thank you for your time in the presentation nick thank you so much that was very informative really appreciate all that information um, um i want to just ask a few questions that was a great presentation i actually really learned a lot and this idea of a carbon-centric approach is a novel um, idea to me and like you mentioned um, if in order to create amino acids nitrogen ha nitrogen has to be bound to carbon what am I missing why is this not considered a macronutrient um, I think part of what it comes down to is how regulatory agencies describe or define what is considered an essential macronutrient um, you know I think going back to the original uh, title of the presentation, we wanted to call it the, um, the forgotten element, but I think people are pretty aware of carbon. They just don't understand just how important it is. So I, I guess to answer your question, the reason that it's not considered a macronutrient maybe is simply because of how regulations are set up right now and how macronutrients and certain elements are classified. But certainly it's true that carbon is required um, in significantly larger quantities. In some cases, there's more carbon than all other elements combined. Like when we're looking at terpenes and cannabinoids, those are hydrocarbons. Interesting. Um, so my last question, I guess, is, you know, if a healthy plant, if a healthy looking plant can have a carbon deficiency, um, is there anything outside of sending in leaf samples to a lab that you say home growers could do from home? Um, are there ever visual signs? Um, and would something like humic or fulvic acid uh, help, say, hydroponic rows to make uh, it more bioavailable? Yeah, certainly fulvic acid for hydroponic growers, because um, the fulvic fraction is a lot smaller and it's more soluble. Humic typically at some, at some 
uh, molecular weight or molecular size that humic is technically insoluble and it becomes a constituent of the actual soil. So it has some physical properties to the soil medium. Um, and even if you're growing in a soil less medium like coca coir, for example, there are still notable benefits associated with using humic. So um, I'd say the best thing to do for a home grower who's just trying to figure out whether the added carbon is going to make that big of an impact is to try to find a way to have some added CO2 in the room and see how the plants uh, operate. You know, most of our commercial customers, they have CO2 injection in their bloom rooms because they're sealed, so they can go three or four times above the normal atmospheric concentration, right? If it's 400 ppms roughly in the, in the atmosphere right now, then they're going up to 12 to 1500 ppms overall. And what they find is that they can actually push the macronutrients even harder, you know, more nitrogen in the form of nitrates and, and more uh, ammoniacal phosphate or more potassium phosphate, um, more calcium, certainly more magnesium. So having that extra carbon allows the plants to have an extra nutrient load because they'll balance it out. You know, the carbon will act basically as a buffer against all of the other macro elements. But the reverse is not necessarily true, right? If you have normal atmospheric levels, there's an upper limit to just how much fertilizer you can apply to your plants before you start to experience some adverse impacts, right? If you want to raise the ceiling, the best way to do it is to add more carbon to the system. CO2 works. I know some people have put like a, a packet of sugar and some brewer's yeast inside of a bottle of water and they shake it up and, you know, as the yeast ferment the, the sugars and break them down, they'll release CO2. Um, so, you know, for home growers, that's probably a pretty effective way of doing it. Um, certainly, you'd want to get some kind of PPM meter to measure just how much CO2 is in the air. Great. Well, Nick, I really appreciate your time. Um, you know, our viewers go check out Rooted Leaf. Um, and if you haven't yet and you've made it this far in the video, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any questions, uh, please leave them for either Nick or myself in the comment section on YouTube, and we'd be happy to get back to you as soon as possible. And uh, stay home, stay safe, and we appreciate the time. Thanks, everybody.